All right, hi again, Attorney Steve Vondren. We're back. In this video, we are talking about the first sale doctrine. Okay, so this is a real important legal issue. It's a little little tricky, but then again, it's really not. So let's go through that, okay? Attorney Steve Vondren, here's our standard disclaimer. You can review that. All right, let's get down to it. First sale doctrine is best explained with an example. So I'm gonna walk you through an example of how this works. This, this relates to trying to sell goods online and are you going to get in trouble for that okay so let's have an example here say diane writes a book the book is protected by copyright diane registers the copyright with the united states copyright office which by the way is not required but does have its benefits one thing being you can it's a prerequisite to filing a lawsuit and seeking your statutory damages and attorney fees um, when that copyright is registered or, or when it's fixed in a tangible medium expression either way certain bundle of rights apply there's certain bundle of rights that every copyright holder has whether it's a book movie video song lyrics whatever everybody that has creates something creative and fixes it in tangible medium of expression has this bundle of rights which is very cool for example you have the exclusive right to reproduce, distribute, make copies, publicly perform the copyrighted work, publicly display the copyrighted work, and to create derivative works derived from the copyrighted work, okay? So it's a lot of rights you get, and each of those rights can be individually licensed. For example, um, the rights to publicly perform the book to a theater company can be granted. Rights to distribute the book can be can be granted to a certain distributor or the rights to make a derivative work for example could be could be granted in a written contract to a movie production company so you have this bundle of rights they can all be licensed and that's typically how it works okay so bear that in mind now let's say Diane agrees to sell her book at Barnes and Noble stores so she's trying to distribute it get it out there she gets into a contract with Barnes and Noble says sell my books you'll get a piece of the action so a purchaser walks into the store he let's call him jack so we have jack and diane buys the book and reads it after reading it he wants to recoup let's say it was a 20 dollars book he wants to sell it online for five bucks and recoup some of that some of that money so he seeks to sell it on ebay or other internet websites such as craigslist offer up or amazon.com after he lists the product for sale Diane sees that he is selling the book and calls her friend who happens to be a family law attorney and her lawyer tells her Jack cannot sell your book he does not hold the copyrights you do and if I were you I would sue him for copyright infringement well Diane says why don't we have the lawyer send a cease and desist letter which he does threatening to sue Jack for selling the book online now also sends a DMC takedown notice to eBay telling them to take down the listing, which normally they will. There's a little counterback process that you can do, but um, that's what would probably happen. Now, question is, will Diane win her case? Absent other facts, no, she will not win the case. Why? Because of the first sale doctrine. It's also known as, by the way, the exhaustion rule or the rights of first use. So you may hear these words used interchangeably. The first to sale doctrine says that once a copyright holder, like Diane, sells her copyrighted work and the ownership transfers, example, to Jack, then Diane's right to restrict further sales by Jack is prohibited. So after the ownership transfers, it's like selling a car. You, somebody sells you a car, you buy it, you can go resell the car. So that's kind of what the doctrine's all about. Keep in mind that Diane is still the copyright hold holder. So she still has all those other rights. It's just that Jack has the right to sell the book, okay? Um, but Jack can sell the book, as I noted here, or donate it to a library, sell it online, give it away, whatever you can do, whatever you can do as an owner, you know, so forth and so on, okay? Here's some more facts about the first sale doctrine that you should know. First, state, the first sale doctrine is set forth in the United States copyright law. That's a federal law. The section that you would be looking for, if you're looking for this, is section 17 USC 109. What's the rationale for the law? Why do we have this law? 
I have three reasons down here. A, fosters a robust secondary market for the goods. For example, I mean, think about eBay. Where would eBay even be if people couldn't buy and sell their goods online? So in the United States, we have a robust market for that. Netflix rentals so that people can rent it. Um, selling, selling your things on eBay, donating books to a library, things like that, okay? B, it avoids the problem of of Jack having to go seek permission every time he's going to sell something on eBay. You know, that would be crazy. You have to run around everything you're selling, get the copyright holder's permission. That would be nuts, right? So the first sale doctrine prevents you from having to do that. And at the end of the day, places limits on the copyright holder's exclusive rights. It is important to note, however, that it limits the distribution rights, but it doesn't limit the other rights. For example, Jack cannot just say, hey, I'm the owner, I can go make copies of it. That would be copyright infringement. He can't go make a movie about it. That would be copyright infringement. He'd be making a derivative work. Okay, so bear that in mind, and I think you will start to understand the concept. Now, here's the text of the law. If you're wondering what it says, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, not going to read it. You can look at that. Essentially, what it requires is that you're the owner of the work. You have to have that title transferred to you, and that's going to be important in one of the few next slides here. So the question is, do you own? Do you are you the owner? Do you have the right to sell that on eBay or Craigslist or, or elsewhere? So um, Now, the reason why that's important, we're talking about Werner versus Autodesk. This is a big case that could change the landscape. Um, or I should say has changed the landscape. This deals with selling software online. Now what happened here is an alleged purchaser, and I use the word purchaser because it was somebody that purchased the software, um, tried to sell it online, same thing. Autodesk said, no, you can't do that. You're not the owner, just like Diane did. And basically what Autodesk was arguing is, we never transferred the title to you. You never got the title. How could that be, the seller said. Uh, I bought it, you know, I'm the owner. And the what happened here is, is Autodesk said, you have to refer to the end user licensing agreement, what we call the EULA, E-U-L-A, you have to refer to that. And had you read that, Mr. Purchaser, you would have realized that you are only a licensee of the software. You have only licensed it. You did not obtain title to the software, therefore you are not the owner, you do not have rights to sell it online. So that's a big case. Um, and the big takeaway for, for, all, for everyone basically dealing with anything that they think they're buying, you have to make sure you are the owner of a copyrighted work before you begin selling it online. Otherwise, you're subject to the cease and desist letter, the DMC takedown, and potentially a federal court lawsuit. Not what you want when you're just trying to sell your stuff, right? So that's an important thing. Yes, as I note here, end user license agreements are tremendously complex. Many of them are a thousand words or more, complicated. Even if you do read it, Oftentimes you won't even know what it means or you wouldn't know case law that may interpret those the different um, clauses that are in the end user license agreement. However, that's the way it is. Um, there's arguments about click rack and click wrap and shrink wrap things, you know, hey, I never consented, I never read it, but you know, those cases are probably usually going to be a loser. All right, so that's Werner versus Autodesk again, big case that changed the landscape and key, key case to keep in mind about licensing, okay? More tidbits about first sale doctrine. We want you to have all that information. Also applies to trademarks. What does that mean? So if you have a product, it has a trademark on it, you can sell it without risk of a trademark infringement lawsuit, okay? Defendant, um, how does this come up? You get sued or you get a cease and desist letter, you're responding or your attorney's responding, you would raise the first sale doctrine as a defense, okay? Does that make sense? Um, also, interestingly, it applies in criminal copyright cases. So if somebody is has infringed to a high degree or alleged to be infringing to a high degree, they take you to the United States attorney, takes you to court, this, that, and the other. You can raise it as a defense. And there's a split of authority whether this is an affirmative defense or whether the burden is on the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the first sale doctrine does not apply, okay? Um, key cases, these are some of the key cases. Real quick, Bob's versus Mer Bob's Merrill versus Macy's. This is a case from 1908. 
a long time ago, but this case was similar. And this was a book where the publisher of the book, Bob's Merrill, said there was a notice on the first page of the book that said, you cannot sell this book for less than a dollar. If you do, that's going to be deemed copyright infringement. Well, what did Macy's do? Got a bunch of copies, put it in their stores, and sold it for less than a dollar. Lawsuit ensues, everybody's going haywire, and obviously the first Macy's is arguing the first sales doctrine, and Bob's Merrill is arguing, you infringed my copyright. It's almost like an end user license agreement. We had the notice right there in the first page. You should have seen it, you should have read it, and you're bound by that. Well, the court said, no, that's not really gonna float. This was, like I said, 1908, that's not gonna float. First sale doctrine applies. So that was one of the early key cases, if not the first, to establish that first sale doctrine right. Okay, so again, now distinguish that with the Werner case. A notice is not quite the same as an agreement. When you're buying software online, you're clicking or you're buying music online or movies online, you're usually clicking that I agree button and the terms of service are in there. You're clicking that I agree, that's a contract. They're telling you the terms and they're saying, if you don't want this, then click away, go away, we don't want you. You have to be able to agree to the contract. So the notice in the book was a little bit different than a contract. So in this case, the title transferred um, Macy's was in the right, okay? Next case, Kurt Sang versus John Wiley and Sons. Wiley and Sons. Um, this is a really interesting case. So this case involved a Thailand native who bought non-pirated textbooks in Thailand and had them shipped to the United States and allegedly made $1.2 million on eBay. So what happened is he found out, he when he came to the United States, he found out that they were selling these textbooks that were at a much higher price in the United States than you could get them in Thailand. So what he did is he had some of his friends and family members buy the books, ship them across it to the United States, import them in, and this is called gray market goods, and he, he basically sold them and made a lot of money on eBay. <laughs> and so obviously he was taken to court. Um, John Wiley and Sons, the copyright holder of the textbooks, said you can't do that. And obviously this was an issue about price control and wanting to control the price here in the United States. And, you know, Kurt Sang said, for sale doctrine, I bought it. They're not pirated. I bought them legally and I'm selling them. And what's the big deal? Tough luck. And the court agreed. So this case went up to the United States Supreme Court, six to three decision, first sale doctrine applies to these imports, okay? So that's a really important case. Next, we have the Omega versus Costco case. This is another interesting one, Omega the watchmaker. Um, it's similar to Kurt saying, but dealt with Costco buying Omega Seamaster C watches. Valid, I don't know much about because I don't really use watches, I don't wear them, so this one I found to be interesting. Um, but it dealt with those Omega watches that I think they sold for somewhere around 1400, 1500, somewhere in that price range. And Costco found a way again to validly purchase these um, products overseas, shipped them into the United States and sold them for a couple hundred bucks less than Omega did. So of course, Omega's up in arms. They wanna control the price. They wanna keep making their big profits and not having people go to Costco to get them. So big lawsuit ensued. This went on for years and years. I mean, I think this was, I think it was six, seven, eight year case, it was a long case. Um, and one of the things that Omega had done to try to stop the importation of these gray market goods, as they're called, is they put a little logo on the back of the watch. It was a it was a little tiny globe on the back of the watch, and it had the Omega. It's kind of the horseshoe logo positioned on the watch. So they had sort of their copyright and a trademark on there, and so they argued because of that, because of that copyright, that was you know you could not import their watch because of because of this. And Costco said, what are you talking about? You're just trying to, you're trying to do a workaround here. That's a copyright misuse. That's a defense in copyright law. It's a copyright misuse. You know, you're just trying to use this in a clever way to prevent importation of non-infringing goods. So this case went on back and forth, up and down. Um, to my knowledge, I believe this one ended with basically a finding of no copyright infringement, again, under this first sale doctrine, okay? 
That's another important case. Now here we are shifting into the world of digital property, online digital assets. So many things nowadays are digital, the eBooks, the iTunes, the streaming video, mobile apps, all these things, everything's you know, transmitted digitally. And so the question arises, what do you still own these things? You're buying them and lots of times, for example, people will go to amazon.com or other sites and it'll say buy now and now most of us think of buy we go well buy that means I'm going to be the owner that means I can do what I want with it so again but the what happens is the buy now takes you right through the process and you end up back with the contractual terms of use the terms of the sale and and that I agree button so so it's you know you just have to use your common sense and the best thing you can do is look into the end user license agreement and say, do I have a license? Do I own this or do I have a license? So you got to do the due diligence and just take a look in there. You can do like a control F search and put license and you'll probably see if it's licensed in a, in a search of the document, okay? So again, read the EULA. Copyright holders may be reserving certain rights in there. They may be transferring only a license. And um, so that raises the issue, capital, records versus redigi was the case that came up and it was a company redigi that wanted to be the what they called it the world's first used digital marketplace for music okay so it was a way to allow people to resell their itunes now i had over a thousand songs in my itunes and then you know i got alexa and i started just listening to alexa and I didn't really need my iTunes anymore, but I, you know, I had over a thousand, probably twelve hundred something songs. I could have resold those if Redigi is found to be a legal business model. So this came up, and of course, Capitol Records went crazy on this case, um, and they argued that you're infringing our copyrights. So Redigi was doing what they were doing is trying to take your iTunes song out of your music and put it up into the cloud and then sell it for usually like you know what as they advertised half the price of what a song would be i'm you know you know the songs aren't that expensive anyway but they were trying to create a music digital marketplace for used music so it's pretty novel um at the end of the day capital records won the case redigi tried to try to do a little workaround where they said okay well we won't transfer it up to the cloud, which the court found to be a an illegal copy, and they said, "Why don't we just we'll we'll keep it there and we'll allow users to have a key to access the music." So it's a little complicated. I'm going to do a separate video on this case because I think it's a really important case. But at the end of the day, this case is now on a. From what I understand, at looking at the Redigi.com website as of today, it's on appeal. And it looks like the case is going to be heard in like five weeks. So they're still fighting for that business model um, to, you know, make that music something that you own and something that you can transfer. But of course, you know that they're going to be fighting this tooth and nail. So this is a case to watch. We'll be back reporting on this. Once we have the final decision, I'm going to do a comprehensive video so you get a little more understanding of the first sale doctrine as applied to digital property. Final takeaways, this is it. You made it this far, we're almost there. Thanks to the federal law, you can sell the books, music, videos, recordings, um, art, paintings, video games. Example, copyrighted works. You can sell copyrighted works as long as you are the owner, the lawful owner. The title has transferred to you. Make sure to read your end user licensing agreements, your terms of service, your terms of the sale. Make sure, even if you see a buy now button, because you may find that your, your, right, your legal rights have been controlled or restricted or taken away. Um, legal importation of non-pirated copyrighted goods are likely to pass muster, um, of course, depending on the facts of your case. And with that, we are done. You now know more than most people on the planet and the entire planet will ever know about the first sale doctrine. If you need some help with a copyright legal issue, attorneysteve.com is where you can go. Find our website and get more information there and contact us. Make sure also, if you like this video, give me a thumbs up. You know, those help me out. So keep me going. Keep me incentivized. We really appreciate your viewership. And you can catch all our great videos at attorneystevevideos.com. We appreciate it. Have a great day. That's the first sale doctrine. We'll talk again.